So yes, yeah, so in this second section, I'm going to talk a little bit about and demonstrate how humans interrupt each other and also what the communicative conversational purpose and functions of these interruptions and overlapping talk is. And I'm going to start with a clip from that American sitcom classic Friends. In case you've never seen Friends, it was a very long running series about a group of six friends living in New York. And this clip comes from a storyline which focuses on Monica, who's there indicated on the screen. And she wants to have a baby, but she doesn't have a partner. So she's decided to visit a sperm bank. And her brother, Ross, also there on the screen, is trying to discourage her. So in this first bit of the clip, what you're going to see is Ross saying, you can't do this, Mon. If you do this, I'm going to. And then he hesitates and stumbles over what he is going to threaten her with. Um, so let's hear that. You can't do this, Mon. All right, if you do this, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to. You gonna... know what? OK, so she interrupts him here and then we carry on with the scene. I'm going to tell mom. <laughs> OK, so here, this isn't really an interruption in the script and the laughter is about threatening to tell their mum when they're both grown up. It's, they're not laughing. The audience isn't laughing at that interruption. But in the second part, a few seconds later in, in, the, in the episode, um, they, they're still talking about whether or not having a, a sperm donor baby is the ideal way to have one. Um, and now interruption is going to become part of the script. So this isn't the ideal way to do oh, something. It's not the Lips moving, still talking. <laughs> So in this clip, Monica hasn't finished her turn when Ross starts talking in overlap. And this is treated as a violation of turn taking by Monica, who stops what she's doing to chastise Ross, lips moving, still talking. So this is a sitcom, and so the audience laughs. In ordinary talk, maybe the parties will laugh or maybe they'll start to have an argument. But what's interesting is to generate this scene, Ross must begin speaking at a point where Monica has obviously not finished her turn. And so what we're interested in is that sort of tacit knowledge that is needed to both write and act the scene. So the script writers and the actors both need to know several things about how a turn is built uh, and how turn taking works in order to make it work. So here's a transcript of what Monica says and the square brackets there that you can see are where Ross starts and stops talking and we'll look at what he does in a moment. Conversation analysts have found that speakers are sort of normatively entitled to one unit in a turn, and we call the, these units turn constructional units. So here comes the science bit. Uh, and these are the building blocks of any and all conversations. So Monica's first TCU ends with the word something. That's where her intonation falls. She's completed an action in that TCU, a sort of rebuttal. But then she starts another TCU, that but, and then she abandons that. Um, and takes another one. And if you're ever wondering what uh, it, not getting a word in edgeways looked like, it, it's this moment in the transcript where Monica finishes that first bit and then latches immediately into the next bit of her term that she's trying to chunk together. Uh, and you can see that there with the equal sign. But, but she abandons that second one and then produces a third TCU to say, lips moving, still talking. So as well as these TCUs, the other thing that is very important for turn taking, of course, is knowing when you can take a turn. And we call these moments of when you can take a turn in interaction transition relevance places. So here's one TRP at the end of that first chunk. Um, and here's another one at the end of that, that, that third chunk. And so it, it, after every transition relevance place, either the next speaker starts talking or the original speaker keeps talking. And that's basically how it works. So here's Ross's turn and you can see it there sort of straddling um, much of Monica's turn. And we call this technically an interjacent overlap. So Ross begins talking when Monica hasn't finished uh, and he produces one TCU and, and there's a TRP at the end of it. Now, if this is all, if you want more of this and you like all this technical stuff, then we can send you an article where it, all of this stuff is, is spelled out in a lot more detail. But the point of this really is that you can start to identify a lot more things about different ways of overlapping talk um, that don't really fit that more morally laden description of barge in or interruption. Um, whilst on the, on the other hand, conversation designers mostly focus on this, this, this kind of uh, interjacent overlap, actually, um, a barge in. Um, and I'm going to give you examples of some of these things. So, for example, transition space overlap can occur very innocently when the current speaker is uttering, um, it reached the end of a possible unit of talk, um, and then they continue as the next speaker starts. And I'll show you that in a moment. 
Uh, another common form of overlap is called last item onset, um, when the next speaker starts up while the current speaker is uttering the last word or syllables of their turn. And I'll give you some examples of this as well. Then there is post transition onset. So all of these technical things that have been described many times by conversation analysts. Um, and, and all of these things are quite often collaborative rather than competitive. And the stereotypical kind of interruption, um, which is the one that we saw in the Friends transcript, is this last one, this interjacent overlap, where the incoming speaker starts talking before the current speaker has reached a point of possibly finishing their turn. And these are the ones that can feel unwelcome or, or competitive. So I'm just going to show you some more examples of interruption from human human talk. So this one is an example of what's called transition space overlap. And you're going to see a real call. Uh, the voices are anonymized and it comes from the end of a telephone conversation between a member of the public to a neighbor dispute mediation helpline. So the caller's got a dispute with an upstairs neighbor, but he's agreed to mediate. And as the call is ending, the caller is going to take an opportunity to display his reasonable, reasonableness and how lovely he is as a good neighbor to the mediator. Here it comes. I mean, half the battle of, as you are aware, of high rise living is to get on with your neighbours, and generally Absolutely. we do in this block. So there's the point, as the caller says, neighbours, where you can see that equal sign again, and he's rushing to sort of get into another chunk of, of talk. And it's at this point that the mediator comes in to say, absolutely, yeah. And so here, the overlap doesn't compete with the caller at all, but in fact, positively assesses and aligns and affiliates with, with the caller's stance towards um, what a great neighbour they are. So you can start to think about things like, would we want a cooey to enthusiastically join in and endorse what we're saying or be able to recognize our enthusiasm or lack of it for what they are currently saying? Or isn't this really the kind of thing that we should be aspiring for our voice assistants to be able to do? But here's another example of um, this interjacent overlap where someone interrupts in that classic sense. Um, and this one is from the start of a police negotiation with a person in crisis. And what you're going to see is that the negotiator is kind of put, trying to hide the fact that they are a police officer by saying, my name is David, but the person in crisis wants to know who they really are. Hello, my, my, um, hey. I'm just here to try and help. Yeah, who are you? I'm from where? I'm, I'm from the place. So on lines three to four of the transcript, you can see a delay there, line three of, of six tenths of a second. And then what happens is the interjacent overlap. So the negotiator starts talking again at line four, but it's here that the person in crisis interrupts um, to halt the production of the negotiator's next turn. So they basically want to stop the negotiator carrying on in the trajectory that their head is so that they can establish something else about who it is that they're actually talking to. This next example is a call uh, to a contact centre from um, a caller who's a customer of a holiday sales company. And in this one, what you'll see is that the customer needs help from a human call taker after struggling to use the online booking system. And I just want you to watch here for the laughter from the salesperson. And the laughter is there to sort of affiliate with the caller's dilemma, but she's not trying to take the floor away from the caller or stop the caller explaining why she's calling. And you'll also see that the caller kind of merges her turns with the salesperson. So they, they talk in synchrony. Good evening, Mr. James. How's you speaking to How can I help? Hi, good evening. I'm trying to, um, I'm a lady of a certain age and going on line to give me a headache. <laughs> I don't know what I've pressed now. I'm trying to do a booking. Could you check the availability? Okay, in this one, um, we're going to see an example that shows how it doesn't even take an overlap or clash of voices to make an interruption happen at all. And this is from an interview between a suspect, a, a, a crime, a suspect of, of a crime uh, and a police officer. And you'll see that the, in, in this interview, um, you can halt somebody else doing something without actually interrupting them at all. Do you think that your behaviour, coupled with the other 12 or so that came out? Yeah, I've got a mind of own, so you can... Are you gonna let me finish what I'm saying? Yes, no, oh, I haven't finished. I'll stop talking when I finish. Do you think that your behaviour? So here the suspect halts the police officer's attempt to build that action, that first question, but doesn't actually talk over her. 
And then what you can see at the end um, is to get back on track, the police officer restarts the question um, at line 14 by recycling what she'd originally tried to build as her question at line one. OK, so finally, we want to show you how examples of overlaps, these, these different types of overlaps, can tell you a lot about what counts as effective conversational experience. So I'm going to show you a patient calling their doctor's reception to make an appointment. And we're going to join the call just as the patient is reciting her patient number. And what we're going to see is the end of a successful call in which the receptionist summarizes the details of the patient's appointment. And then collaboratively, they will end the call together. And as this call comes out, you will also see um, two examples of what we call last item onset um, of simultaneous talk in the clip. It's um, two, yeah, that's nice. Lovely, that's great. Okay, so that's 8.50 on Wednesday the 8th for you. Right, thank you very much. Okay, bye. bye, -bye. But in contrast, in this second uh, example of a call to the set, to, to a, to a, a, um, a patient, uh, sorry, a, a, a GP surgery, the patient's also made an appointment. But here, rather than the receptionist confirm the appointment, the patient has to really push to get that confirmation. So here it comes. Okay then. Thank so, you. So, that'll be 16. The 16th, okay, 10 past 11. So in fact, we can see at lines three to four where that first um, overlap happens, that the receptionist is moving to close the call before the patient is ready to finish it. And they both start talking at the same time. So the receptionist still gives the patient confirmation of her appointment, but not until the patient has pushed for it by interrupting the receptionist's attempt to finish the call. And in my research, I found that the more of these types of interruptions that occurred in calls, so where patients have got to sort of stop the receptionist by interrupting to make sure they don't just hang up the call at the end and to get that final piece of information. The more of that that happened, the lower the satisfaction ratings were for the surgery. So it can be really useful and important to be quite precise about what kinds of barge in is happening and where it happens and to what use it's being put.